Hey guys, and welcome to Mangotology. My name is Stephen Mango, and I'm an ex-Scientologist who makes videos here on YouTube exposing Scientology. So please make sure to go down below and hit that red subscribe button, turn on your bell notifications, and give this video a big thumbs up. And let's get into um, today's video because there is so much to catch you guys up on. So first and foremost, you guys, I am so, so sorry for not posting for almost two years now, and I'm going to fill you guys in on everything that's been going on since I stopped posting videos. There's some really Really great exciting news and positive developments um, in my life that really go to you know I think that you guys would be happy and proud of the steps I've made in my recovery since leaving Scientology it's now been 10 years I can't believe it since I married my partner um, Jeff and we ended up you know starting my life after leaving and there's been lots of you know, road bumps and stuff if you will along the way but I do have some really great exciting things that I can't wait to share with you guys there's also been bad news I almost died last year in the hospital from an infection that traveled from my spine up to my brain. There's been some like really wild things too. So I just need to fill you guys in on everything. Just have a little bit of a chit chat. And um, you guys have been there for me since the moment I left Scientology, turning on my camera in 2013, having no idea that my video would go so viral to the point that, you know, I was doing documentaries with Louis Thoreau, like literally in my home, exposing Scientology on such a big scale before there was Leah Remini show, before going clear and before it was almost like safe to do so. It was just basically Tori Chrisman, Mark Bunker, I think, and we were basically like the OG YouTubers, if you will, that were exposing Scientology. And now in 2023, there is a lot out there about Scientology. So there's a much bigger group that is bringing awareness to Scientology, but I was doing it from like literally a few months after leaving Scientology. You guys have seen my heartache, my struggles and everything and have been there for me through everything in my darkest days where I was sitting on camera having suicidal ideations and having $50,000 of debt after leaving Scientology, having no clue what I was going to be doing in my life, having so much trauma. And I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's been there and left me emails, messages, comments, everything over the years, because you guys were my therapists that were mostly unlicensed to you know, offer advice and stuff to me. But I really genuinely want to say thank you to start this video to everyone who's been there for me along this 10 year journey because without you guys, I know I would not be sitting here today without your support. So thank you so much, you guys, and I'm so, so sorry for disappearing. So let's catch you guys up without any further ado on what's been happening in the world of Steve Mango. First thing on the positive side, let's start with that. Um, in regards to my mental state and kind of like my recovery since leaving Scientology, I think it's important to discuss this because this is Mangotology after all. So believe it or not, I know you guys will be, I don't know, if shocked is the right word, but I have never been in a better mental space or state, like I would say in my whole entire life. Because as you guys know, in my teenage years and stuff, I was in a Catholic upbringing and I was being severely bullied physically, mentally by not only students, but teachers. The whole entire school would bully me, believe it or not. There'd be these like email, um, like newsletter chain type of thing with the whole school on them. And the students would find out what that email was and they would blast out emails talking about me and these gay derogatory slang terms. And again, it was, in 2004 or something like that. So the internet and online bullying wasn't a thing, but it started to become that because it was like the new advent of the internet. So I was being bullied for my sexuality to the whole entire school and teachers and stuff didn't know how to deal with that sort of thing. So I was being physically assaulted and just scared to go in every single day. Fast forward to after having even family, you know, and my parents and stuff like that being emotionally abusive more than anything, but I ended up in Scientology within two, three months after, you know, leaving that sort of upbringing in a small town and still being in the closet, getting into Scientology and then leaving. Again, not going into my whole life history. I'm saving that for my book about Scientology, which I don't know when my book is coming, you guys, but if I get the mental energy to go through a lot of my trauma and my pain, I'm going to continue writing my my book because I think you guys will see a new side of me and my time in Scientology and really taking you guys through like the day by day of what it was like to be under mind control and how that slowly kind of progressed through you know my journey in Scientology so I never had good mental health and especially after leaving when I felt like there was absolutely nothing left of my life I just wanted to be an auditor six weeks away from moving to Clearwater to join the Sea Org to start auditor training at 
flag when I met Jeff and decided, I guess woke up and decided that this is no longer the path I'm going to be on because I started seeing the truth about what Scientology was and how I was conned by being inside Scientology. So they didn't get me back, you guys. People wonder and think like, oh, Steve Mango was silenced or gagged from speaking out about Scientology. It wasn't that. But when I was talking to Jeff the other day, before even deciding to come back on YouTube, I was even telling him, I'm like, I don't even think about Scientology in the least bit. Not even, like before, it would be all day long, I'd be on the blogs, waking up going right on Tony's blog to see what stories he's posting about exposing Scientology, and then Mike Rinder, and just like doing the most of just really exposing Scientology and trying to hear other people's stories and on message boards and all that sort of stuff. And it was almost like still being involved in that mindset and that world of Scientology and being involved in the ex-Scientology community, which was very toxic, which I've made videos about and I talked on my channel last night doing a live stream with Doug Kramer. I highly recommend you guys check that out. We um, kind of talked about more or less my stuff because it was, you know, my return to YouTube. But yeah, I was just so involved in that world. And now when you guys are going to hear my positive updates with what I'm doing with my life and stuff, I think you guys will be proud of me, but also to say like, yeah, of course, like now you're making strides to better your future, not kind of be stuck inside this Scientology or ex-Scientology sort of mindset. Because you guys, I didn't move to LA in 2009 to join Scientology, leave, and then speak and talk about Scientology for 10 years. If I wanted to be involved digging through Scientology policy letters and involved in, you know, the day-to-day -day with Scientology, I would still be a Scientologist. That doesn't mean that there's not stuff to still be exposed and stuff I want to talk about and my passion of discussing the whereabouts of, say, like Shelley Miscavige, for example, or wanting to kind of do deep dives in the things like Lisa McPherson and stuff. There are stuff I still want to do and say, so I'm not abandoning my channel by saying all of this, but being that I'm not being re-triggered all day, my life was a trauma response here on YouTube, you guys. You saw me sit on camera looking like a prisoner of war many times and feeling like I had absolutely nothing left. I was just a shell of a person here. And now that I kind of found myself and who I am, I'm not reflecting on my past of 10 years ago. This is my video journal of my recovery and everything leaving Scientology and sharing the gut-wrenching sort of pain that I lived with. And now that I'm no longer in that pain and I'm moving forward in my life, I'm not reflecting on that. Scientology was like an abusive relationship. And once people look at it from that respect, it's like if you leave an abusive husband or wife. You're not going to want to talk about them 10 years later when you're trying to move on from them. And if you sit on camera, make it your income, and you make it just like I did, and you make this your whole entire world, it almost feels like, how do I escape this? Because now I'm talking about Scientology all over again every single day. So I wasn't the greatest YouTuber about posting that frequently, but there were times I'd sit down here crying and in tears and just so upset. And I just want to assure that I'm in such a good mental health space. I do not even have a therapist, but I feel like I don't even have any form of like mental illness like I used to. Not I don't have flare-ups of, you know, things that upset me and stuff, but I'm so just level-headed and feeling good and happy every single day that I don't know if it's really good for me to sit on camera every day or even that frequently and talking about my past because I don't want to like derail the good feelings and stuff like that. So that's longer than I wanted to talk about my mental health, but that's the mental health update. Everything's feeling good. I'm happy, better than ever, and my absence of YouTube wasn't because I was struggling, it's actually per the opposite. So let's just keep on this good news train before we get into like how I almost died and all like the negative sort of stuff. So speaking on good stuff too, I am now in college, which I know I told you guys about, and this was kind of going on during the pandemic when um, the pandemic, I guess this is kind of picking things up where we left off. I was telling you guys like, hey, I'm really thinking about going to nursing school. I don't know if I could really do it or not because I'm wanting to be an actor, which we'll talk about what's going on with the acting career and stuff, but I'm like, you know what? I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get through nursing classes and stuff, which will go into my physical health in just a little while. I don't really know if this is what I wanna do with my life, but it's something I have a passion for because I love medical aesthetics like Botox, filler, skincare, just all of that sort of stuff. Believe it or not, I know more about it than you know people would probably guess. Um, I would even, when I tell you about what job I would have, I'd even train like nurses and other people about like aesthetic treatments and stuff. So I took a little bit of a detour from college first and foremost, because I started working at a med spa, which I can't talk about it for like legal purposes, but um, there was a med spa in Beverly Hills that I worked at as a patient coordinator, and that's what kind of was getting my feet wet because I wanted to see if I even wanted to work in this industry before I went and invested tens of thousands of dollars to go back to college. So I 
took the jump doing a normal job. I disappeared from YouTube because when you work nine to five, the last thing you wanna do when you get home from a day like that is to sit down, turn on a camera and a ring light and start talking about your past pains and upsets and failures and all that sort of stuff. So I got that job and I killed it. I you know, was doing everything from, you know, patient scheduling to numbing patients for like lip filler to taking their before and after photos, consents, turning over the nurse's room, um, dealing with any potential complications that may arise with getting appropriate handlings for stuff like that. It was just everything involving running a medical spa. Then I kind of embellished my resume and I got a job. This was last year or so. Um, for a few months, I worked actually managing a medical spa in the El Segundo area. It was a chain med spa with several locations, but I was in charge of a multi-million dollar medical spa, you guys. I never made like a six-figure salary in my life. I'm like, oh my God, like I was just making, you know, however much money here, a couple hundred, a few thousand a month, maybe at the most, but I never had like that type of employment before where I had several nurses under me, NPs, MDs, like the most I was doing, you know, running payroll to, you know, doing sales, making sure we can do six-figure sales every single month, leading my team to do that, working with product reps, pharmaceutical people, having to order products like Botox and fillers and inventorying medical supplies. And again, you guys saw me on camera, barely able to get up out of bed, coming and sitting and making a video, just talking. I couldn't even muster up the strength inside me to do that. Going from that type of Steve Mango to the person who you guys see today, who is able to show up day after day to, you know, lasers and just doing like so many different elements of running a medical spa. There's so much to it and it was so overwhelming, but I was able to get through it. So I just wanted to share that now that I'm in college, um, I'm about to probably start the actual nursing classes and clinicals and all that stuff probably in a few months, which I'm excited about. I'm doing almost like all A's. I have like a 99.81 in my sociology class and stuff. So I'm doing so well beyond the belief of my imagination that I could be doing in college because I always just considered myself a creative type of person. Never thought I'd be interested in science and stuff, but I'm going to go for my RN, become a aesthetic nurse with a bachelor's degree, and then I want to become a nurse practitioner so I could prescribe medication and being able to work more autonomously as I'd be able to do as an NP. have to get through all the regular nursing sort of stuff to be able to get to the point of doing like plastic surgery sort of aesthetic nursing side of stuff, but I never in my wildest dreams would have thought I would, from the days of wanting to move into Scientology to be a Sea Org, you know, auditor to now all of a sudden wanting to work in the medical field and I was so anti-medicine and so anti-psychiatry, all of that to be like, oh my God, I think I really want to work in the medical field. It's just crazy how life takes you in that direction. So I'm doing a lot of my schoolwork from home, which I have the luxury and pleasure to be able to do until I have to actually start the nursing part. So it's a good segue into actual like nursing school. I know where I want to go. My husband has money saved for me to be able to go to a private nursing school, which is one that doesn't have wait lists and stuff like that. I basically take a test to go in and just sign up and it's very expensive. I think four years if I didn't have the prerequisites would be like $130,000. It's about half that cost with the prerequisites. So I'm, I don't have five years to waste to go on a nursing waiting list at community college and be 36 just to start. So I'm going to streamline and get myself in so I can get through and actually have my career, which I'm really excited about that. Yeah, so I've been working in the medical aesthetics field and stuff, but what happened, why I got fired from that job is because my health took a turn for the worst in two ways. I have tumors and now I have, or I had an infection that almost killed me. So let's talk about the infection. So one day I was doing my skincare routine because that's one of my passions is skincare and stuff. So I was doing all my 20 million step routine when I was putting on a neck cream, which I never really used that type of cream before, but again, it's prescription grade and I have kind of sensitive skin. So the fumes of the product was kind of irritating. I thought, I, so I thought, right? So I'm going and lying in bed and I'm realizing I can't see out of my right eye. And it felt like almost like the lens, like the cornea or something had a smear of cream. So I thought, again, it doesn't make sense, but I thought I had cream smeared on my eye. And I hope that I'm not talking too fast. I'm just trying to get through a lot of information about my update really quickly, but I just couldn't see the television. I'm, I'm like going through my glasses, like trying to like de-smudge them. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? When I realized I was blind out of my right eye. 
So messaging that job that I had and they're like, can you still run payroll? Um, Cause I was telling them the next morning, it's like your employee just randomly had an ocular stroke and you're asking me to run payroll. The company was crazy. They had, I think like 10 other managers in the span of three years before me, which just goes to show you any company that has that much turnover of managers making a big salary, something is completely amiss and wrong. And again, we can talk more about my life in more details if you guys wanna hear more of the nitty gritty of things so I can share with you what my life was like during the last two or three years. But again, it was a really crazy job, but I went to an ocular ophthalmologist is the word I'm looking for. I went to the ophthalmologist. He said, yes, you had an ocular stroke. And again, they had no idea what was causing it. They did 3D images in my eye and everything. They're basically like, hey, you went blind. I was legally blind in my right eye. Thank God I have my full vision back. But there was a letter on like the wall. It was like a letter E because I could see it out of my other eye. It was huge on the wall. I could not even see anything out of my right eye. So that's what sent me into a big depression. Like last year, was this was around like March of last year, like almost 13 months ago or something, 14 months ago. And I was just devastated. Like, oh my God, I went blind and I don't know what's going on and no doctor can tell me what's happening. Now, during this time as well, I was having this like severe shooting pain in the right or the left side of my head. I'm looking at myself and I'm like looking, but anyway, so the left side of my head and it was these crippling debilitating migraines that I thought were migraines that were sending me into the ER. And again, they just gaslight you a lot of these medical professionals saying you're stressed, maybe you're drug seeking, um, oh, you're just anxious or you have stress at work or some sort of thing. And they just roll their eyes if you're at the ER for a migraine. And it's like, I'm not there just to get medication. I'm there for them to do like an MRI or an x-ray or, you know, whatever it would be to be able to diagnose what is going on with this like shooting debilitating pain in my head. And again, they would just, you know, do a push of IV medication and then boom, go home and, you know, try to work on meditation. And I knew after the stroke, something was so wrong with me and I just couldn't tell um, what it was, but I was having daily, seven days a week of these migraines of the pain. It felt like something was eating at my brain. That's how severe it was. And I knew this wasn't a migraine because I've had migraines and I wasn't that stressed out at the time. So I knew that I had to get to the bottom of this, but it got to such a tipping point when I said, you know what, I need like something just hit me where I said, I have to get help today. So this was a Friday. I went to a doctor that my spouse, um, he goes to like this um, medical group of like several doctors and he spoke to his doctor and they said, hey, have him see Dr. So-and-so, whatever the guy's name was. So I went to that doctor and again, I don't know if at that point they did tests or stuff, but they said, you know what? You need to get like a spinal tap and you, we have to see because I was having really crippling pain in my spine as well. And they said, we, we need you to basically go to the hospital. I went to the hospital and they did a spinal tap and they were doing all sorts of different diagnostic tests and stuff like that. And they were like, oh my God, you have an infection that's in your spine that traveled up to your brain. And if you do not come here because whatever their diagnostic way of being able to discover this was, was that it was at the most severe level that they've seen to be like, hey, like if you did not come today to be able to start the intravenous antibiotics and whatever else they were doing, that you would have died tomorrow, like over the weekend. So what I really want to get across to anyone out there who have doctors gaslighting them or telling them that, you know, there's nothing wrong with them. Please, if you guys have something like this going on, please get, you know, whatever sort of test it is, MRIs, blood work, whatever you have to do. See a million doctor specialists if you have the ability to do it. Because again, if I just went back to work or if I just listened to everyone else in my life that just said, oh, it's probably nothing. It is something because I have a rare disease, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. Um, so I ended up having a pick line with IV int um, intravenous antibiotics for like, you know, six to eight weeks or something crazy like that. I was in the hospital for, you know, almost a week or something like that. And um, again, it was no joke because the infection was in my spine and it went up to my brain and was killing me and was eating at it. And that's why I was having those migraines, which guess what? They went away after I did it. Now I'm getting a couple like stress induced kind of migraines just from like other sort of stuff with like doing so much schoolwork and stuff, but it's not like the pain that I was having from these crazy debilitating migraines that I had. So it kind of set a, you know me in a damper and a kind of a bad mood because that's when my job fired me because I was gone for two, three months. They were holding my job, but because I was only working there for you know a few months, they had it in their legal right to have an out because I was an at-will employee that they could say, hey, you know what? This isn't working out or we can't hold a job for you forever. And they were crazy anyways there. And that's a whole nother story that we can get into if we want to chit chat about that in the future, but I was just like, oh my God, now I had this job managing a huge medical spa, got fired from this job. I was having a major health 
um, crisis that now is causing lingering sort of cognitive impairment type of stuff and memory and just feeling just fuzzy a lot and having chronic intractable pain, which we're gonna get to. So I was just like really, like kind of like in like a damper sort of mood. When now, think about that happening now, I was unemployed. And then all of a sudden last year too, they discovered nine tumors. So you guys know I had a tumor excised on S2, S3 with the laminectomy and a decompression. That was in like 2018. And I thought it was more or less like a one-off type of thing. But when they were doing a thoracic MRI of my upper back, they said, hey, you know what? You have like these three tumors that are on your right rib cage, intercostal, so in the muscle but they're small, they're not causing you any pain or issues, not cancer, any of these tumors. I have a condition called schwannomatosis, where these schwannomas, these tumors, it's derived from neurofibromatosis type two. You guys may have heard of um, neurofibromatosis with the tumors that are like all these tumors all on the X, you know, on the um, outside of the person's body. This was all on the inside of my body, these type of tumors that cause pain, they're inside the nerve. So if this is the nerve, the tumors are in there. So you can imagine how painful as the nerves are trying to send messages or do whatever they do or just the pain of having any sort of tumor or something inside the nerve. So when you breathe, they're like firing off signals like this going like haywire. So all of a sudden when I'm breathing, last year I'm noticing, oh my God, I'm having pain inside the ribs, inside the muscle where the tumors are. So I was so nervous that I had, you know, these tumors growing or acting up, which they were. So basically what was discovered that I had six of clinical significance on the right side when I had only three small ones, but there's so many other like little small ones that they're not, you know, counting each and every single one of like probably 50 of them or something, but of like the bigger ones that they're noting maybe causing pain, six on the right side, three on the left side. The thing is they're inside the muscle and the nerve and the only way like they, they're basically inoperable where yeah, they could break my whole chest wall. They can go try to take out some of them and guess which ones are causing the most pain go inside the nerves and do whatever they would have to do they would risk puncturing the lungs if they puncture one lung they could repair it by putting in a tube or something if they puncture them bilaterally on both sides then you basically die because both of your lungs are punctured they can't fill up with air then what happens after breaking the whole chest wall going in and removing the tumors with this condition the tumors just pop up it's a genetic condition I was born with and these tumors, and I only discovered it as an adult after Scientology, because you can't go for an MRI really or get healthcare when you're in Scientology. Pain is considered psychosomatic. You may have overts and withholds, which are these crimes that, or these like things that are considered sins in Scientology that you're like hiding and withholding from telling them. And they think that that's causing like psychological distress and causing psychosomatic pain. So crazy, but that's what they would think. If I'm like, oh, I'm having pain, they would just think it's psychosomatic somatic or something. So yeah, if I was in Scientology and had that infection, probably would have died in Scientology because I wouldn't be getting the healthcare. They would just think, oh, you're just mentally, spiritually distressed. So then these tumors just always grow and pop up all throughout your life on the peripheral nervous system, on your spine. You can get them on like cranial nerves, inner ear, like a vestibular sort of schwannoma that throws off your balance on the brain. I had brain scans and stuff. I also have a mild KRE malformation, all these sort of things. But um, I started discovering a lot of stuff with my health, you know, over the last like year or so. So again, if it was just one or two tumors, they could remove it and they would never grow back fine. But I'm not going to have them break my whole chest and have numbness all in my chest wall just to have them grow back and two years like what would the point of that be so there's really nothing they can do i had a, a botched nerve block injection which made my pain even worse in my rib cage so basically what i'm trying to get at is that i live with severe intractable 24 7 pain it's a type of chronic pain that just doesn't go away there's no cure there's no fix and i'm just living in pain 24 7. i've talked about this in the past but not really opened up a lot about my struggles with chronic pain and stuff because of the stigma surrounding chronic pain so if you guys have interest in hearing about more about my journey about chronic pain Maybe I'll share about it here. I talk about it on TikTok and stuff like that, but I was you know, struggling with my health a lot over the last year. I still have the pain, obviously, but I'm just in the place of where I've come to terms with it, that you know, there's nothing I can do to fix this condition, and I just have to keep moving forward in my life. That's why I'm nervous about if I'm gonna be able to get through nursing clinicals, because I'm on disability. I am fully disabled. I could stay the rest of my life and get permanent disability. I'm not on permanent one. I'm just on like a year of disability, but I could just basically live my life as you know being disabled in bed all day but i'm trying to do something to push myself to get out of my comfort zone school has been as you guys know i'm highly intelligent and school is finally giving me a place where i could use my mind and i could you know start really trying to do something 
more positive and beneficial with my life. And I love the mental intellectual stimulation that I'm getting. I've studied psychology, lifespan psychology, all these different things. And I just really love that. Um, I found something that, you know, could challenge me and get me out of my comfort zone because I was so scared to go to school and stuff like that too. Thinking like, oh, I'm 31, I'm old. I shouldn't be going to college at this age, but i um, excited. I'm going to keep you guys posted if you guys want to know more about like my journey of professional sort of like life and stuff like that. So other than that, you guys may see my head is shaved. I went to Turkey to get an FUE hair transplant six weeks ago where they took hair from the donor side. So the sides in the back of my head, they extracted it, drilled in, took out the follicle, and then all in here, my head was fully shaved. You guys can see the video on my TikTok at Stephen F. Mango. Um, and they removed, basically my whole head was shaved, but all in here on the top, they did forehead reduction to lower down my hairline and it's still growing in. It's going to take like nine to 12 month so it's only been like you know a month and a half or two months or something like that but all in here is where they transplanted 3,000 individual hairs over an eight hour surgery you guys fully awake 42 shots or something of local numbing over one hour numbing my whole scalp it was the most excruciating painful thing to numb your whole scalp like that and then the rest of it wasn't like too bad because your head is completely numb it still is and you do like prp injections after and stuff to try to stimulate the hair growth so i flew there it was like a 14 hour flight to go all the way to turkey and you guys know i love aesthetics and stuff and it was a really exciting thing because i was getting self-conscious because of the stress of my health and other things that i've been through over the years i think is why my hairline started to recede back and it was just like giving me so much self-conscious sort of issues so i did that i flew a friend there and this is a whole drama situation i won't go into right now really but i flew a friend there named james i paid 1500 dollars for him to come with me because jeff can't just get up on a whim when he has two law firms and 29 lawyers under him he said hey take your friend james who's a friend of like six months and i said you know what if i want him to come take care of me i'm going to pay for the trip so I paid for him to come with me. Again, only knew him for a short amount of time. And I asked him to do two things for me. Text Jeff and my friend Allie, let him know that I was okay after the surgery or during the surgery, because it was 12 hours ahead and it was the middle of the night. So he wanted to wake up and get a text from James saying, hey, everything went well with Steve's surgery. Then my friend Allie to text her, let her know how the surgery was going. Then just to watch over me, stay at the clinic and make sure everything was going well. So again, this is a very short story I want to tell about it, that as they're drilling into my scalp, the owner of the clinic comes and I said, hey, could James come in and film some videos? Because I'm posting videos about my journey for you guys to see it on my Instagram. And they said, oh no, James left. I'm like, what do you mean James left? And they're like, oh, he left to go shopping when I booked the whole next day, an extra day for the trip so James could go shopping because that's what he likes to do or something like that. So he could have something fun to do while my head is literally pouring fluids, running a fever, having a major eight hour operation in Istanbul in a random country. Here this friend goes and leaves during my surgery when I asked him to stay. This camera that's like six or $800 left in the lobby just sitting there with my backpack with all of my personal information in it and they don't have Jeff's phone number at the clinic because James was the one who was there to accompany me. What's Jeff gonna do? He's, what is, you know, if something happened to me, he's 15 hours away by flight across the other side of the world, right? Because Istanbul is like a hair transplant capital of the world and they do really good jobs at hair transplants and stuff there. So James literally left against my wishes, right? When I'm paying for him to be there. Then I go and at the end of the operation, I'm looking at my phone. He didn't even tell me that he, he left to go shopping or do anything. I basically found that out from the clinic owner. So he was lying to me that he was still there. And then also when I'm looking at my phone and I'm seeing and he um, didn't text Jeff or Ali. He's like, oh, Jeff didn't text me. Yeah, it was the middle of the night. You were supposed to text him. It's the middle of the night. He wants to wake up and be like, yep, everything's going well with Steve's surgery. They just finished the transplant. Everything went well. He didn't text Jeff. He didn't text Allie. All he had to do was send a text message to get a free $1,500 trip there. So I was obviously pissed off, but I didn't tell him I was pissed off until we got back a few weeks later. So I'm talking to him and he's like, I didn't do anything wrong. Why don't you talk to me? I expressed how I felt about him just leaving me, abandoning me in Turkey. And then he posted on his Instagram story, not even to me, a cease and desist being like, I'm trying to like make you know videos or drama about it or basically he had a guilty conscience and he posted a cease and desist to me like hey he's going to sue me if I talk about him to ruin his good name and credibility he doesn't have any followers or attention he's not like a youtuber or something right so it's just funny that he's making it seem like I may come and perpetuate fake drama on my channel or something and talk about the situation and make him look bad or get views and money off of his name I'm like I haven't posted a video in like three years or two years like what sort of fame am I trying to get off of like some random friend that I met on 
Instagram. So it was just completely crazy, you guys. So anyway, so I, I did a beauty procedure a few weeks ago. I got a lot of other cosmetic work done. You guys may see that it looked different. I had PDO threads to lift my eyebrows, my mid face, my jawline, and my neck. I had eight vials of Sculpture Collagen Restimulating Injections to grow volume in my face. I had it into my temples, into my cheeks, lateral and medial. I've had a liquid nose job. I've had um, sculpture and filler into my nasolabial folds, filler into my lips. I have a chin implant. I had obviously the threads in here, but I've had filler and sculpture into here, and I've had filler into all those other areas as well. Um, you guys know I've had 360 degree liposuction on my body. I'm trying to think of what else that I've done. Um, under eye filler. So I've done a lot of like cosmetic work and stuff like that, and it's helped give me more confidence and I'm much more happier and I love testing out beauty procedures that I would love to do on people. Obviously laser I've had on my face and stuff like that. So I've been doing a lot of beauty stuff and that's what one of my passions is and why I'm sharing this with you guys is because that is one thing that I know a lot about and that I'm really passionate about and I get to sit on camera and cry about Scientology more but I don't feel that way anymore. So it wouldn't be authentic of me to come here and act like, oh, I'm so upset about my time in Scientology when I'm not. I have made a lot of strides as I just discussed moving forward in my life and I'm gonna film a video about the ex-Scientology community and why I kind of left and why I stopped posting videos. And that's why I started discovering other areas and avenues that I'm happy with in my life because of the drama and the pain of what I went through in the ex-Scientology community. So that video will probably be coming tomorrow. I'm gonna to edit it and film it right after this. But again, if you guys wanna keep up with me on a little bit more of a close personal basis, you guys can follow me on Instagram. I post daily stories on Instagram of all things going on in my life. So if you're on Instagram and you wanna download Instagram, at Steven Mango, it's gonna be right here. And you can follow me and be a little bit more like closer in the world of Steve Mango, because I don't, while I'm in school and I'm you know, taking finals and tests and all these sort of things, the last thing at the end of the day when I'm tired is wanting to you know, sit on camera and make videos and stuff. Who knows, if I'm inspired and I wanna start making more videos, if you guys show me lots of love and support and are invested in my journey still, I will share more about my mental side of Scientology or I'll share more other people's stories and bring them on my channel. I don't know what that will look like yet, so please let me know in the comments too what you guys would like to see from me. And maybe I can do Q and A's or live streams and we can hang out, but Instagram is a good place, you guys, if you wanna send me messages or I love hearing from you guys and it makes me feel like, you know, what I'm doing here isn't just just like throwing up a video and no one cares and no one wants to hear from me it makes me feel good so if you guys want to share you know comments ideas whatever you can always message me to on instagram or email me my email will be in the description box down below as well um tiktok i've been posting some videos on tiktok about scientology my story i started posting several then i stopped so it's at stephen f mango i have like 60,000 followers on tiktok because i started talking about kirsty alley's death and if it kind of pertains to um, any involvement with Scientology. So if you guys are curious about what I had to say about Kirstie Alley's death and stuff, those videos got like a million views and stuff. So it was another one of those things like, oh, people still want to hear from me about what I have to say about Scientology. So I started posting about, you know, Scientology related stuff over on TikTok. So check that out if you guys want to stay tuned there because there's a better chance I could film quick TikTok videos than fit, you know, sitting down and doing like an actual video like this. So um, TikTok's a good way to reach me or just kind of follow my journey. And again, I'm probably missing stuff if I do miss anything that I really was intending to tell you guys. I'll say it in my next video that I'm about to film. But thank you everyone who's been staying tuned for my journey the last so many years, 10 years, whatever it's been. I'm so grateful and appreciative to everyone who's like even when I did my live stream with Tuck, I'm like people actually still care. They still want to hear from me. It wasn't like I just disappeared off the face of the earth and everyone forgot about me. People were excited to see me back. So it made me want to come back and just tell you guys what's been happening the last few years. I'm in a good place. I, you know, had jobs outside of YouTube. I've been making positive strides. My mental health is in a good place. Yes, my health has had some like bad stuff go on, but you know, things are great with me, my husband and our dogs and everyone is all like good. And it's just, makes me happy that I finally found my place in the world after struggling for so many years. And I just wanted to share that with you guys because I know people were worried about me the last few years and I'm so sorry to leave everyone hanging here, but I will try to come back and leave me a comment, you guys. I love hearing from you, like I just said. I'm thankful for the warm welcome back from the live stream yesterday, but please check in and leave me some comments so I can hear from all my followers and stuff. I love reading them. And give this video a thumbs up, share with a friend, let people know that Steve Mango is back. And I'll see you guys on my next video, hopefully tomorrow, and I will not, I promise, leave you guys hanging for two more years. So, love you guys, bye, I'll see you guys soon.